one only needs to go to Scottsdale. I have no idea how much of Scottsdale's GDP comes from plastic surgery, but it's got to be a lot. <laughs> Sports, our troops, cognitive enhancement tends to be taken up very rapidly. So what the argument against cognitive enhancement on, on these grounds comes down to is not generally that you expect individuals not to cognitively enhance, because they're going to go ahead and do it. What you're doing is you're asking the state to prevent the research or to forbid the enhancement. So what you're doing is you're using the state to impose a particular view of what your ethical system is. That also is problematic. What I take from both of these uh, admittedly very sketched positions, what I take is two things. First, from a technical point of view, there is no question that the human is becoming a design space in a way that it has never been in our history. That's an extraordinary challenge. We're not even thinking effectively about what that means. Second, the responses so far have reflected uh, positions that have been uh, traditional enlightenment kinds of approaches to difficult issues for 200 years. They are inadequate to grapple with the complexity of the situation that we now face. So I think the positions that generally represent what we call public dialogue in these issues are superficial, oversimplistic, um, and increasingly dysfunctional. That's the good news. All right. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, this is challenging. All right, so our question is, can technology make us better? My answer to that is, I guess, yes and no. Uh, throughout human history, technology has transformed all aspects of human life, including human culture. So if we go through the long list of inventions, and in, I guess on that point we can agree, the invention of fire, the wheel, uh, pottery, the domestication of plants and animals, metallurgy, glass, the printing press, and the list can go on and on, uh, clearly has uh, generated uh, a different relationship between the human and the physical environment. So in that sense, uh, I agree that technology is part of being human. There's no way to think about being human without thinking about technological development. However, I think we also agree that contemporary technological advances are quite different. So we are in a new situation here, and I would probably uh, insist on the radical nature of, of our condition right now, where bio, when biotechnology, nanotechnology, robotics, informatics, and communication technology, and oh, I guess we should add also applied cognitive science, uh, all that have, to, uh, have created a new situation in which we engineer ourselves. That to me is the new situation, uh, the fact that we are now redesigning ourselves. And furthermore, you want to sit down here? You want to get closer? All right. Furthermore, we are redesigning uh, the life of future generations. And you can take it one step further. We even try to do um, something that has never been done before, I believe, by humans. Namely, we try to affect the evolutionary process itself. So these change, changes will create a new phase in human evolutionary development in which human beings will presently live longer, uh, will possess new physical and cognitive abilities, and will be liberated from suffering and pain due to aging and diseases. This is the ideal, this is the vision of the transhumanist uh, movement. Um, and I'm going to take some uh, critical uh, perspectives on that, and basically my argument is that the transhumanist vision is superficial, uh, that it's not really going to the heart of being human, that it has a misunderstanding of what it means to be, uh, to be human. So um, what I think is missing in the transhumanist approach is this. To begin with, they equate being human with physicalist and materialist understanding of humanity. I think that's just uh, simply not the case. We are not just a body that can be improved through some kind of technological uh, device. Uh, yes, I do agree that various devices can make our life easier. Uh, I do believe that especially medical development or medical advances can make uh, the life, let's say, of amputees uh, much better because we now have artificial limbs, let's say. We can install pacemakers. We can install a lot of things that can overcome various medical problems. But I think that that has nothing to do with the question of 
whether we can become better humans. And my point is that the word better is a moral category and it cannot be reduced to anything materialistic or physicalist. So there's something fundamentally wrong about the way transhumanists, I believe, approach the problem. And excuse me since you are an engineer, but I think that the mistake here is that approaching the human as an engineering problem and therefore with an engineering solution. I do not believe that we can engineer or that we should engineer the human. I think it's a fantasy that expresses human hubris uh, and the unwillingness of humans to recognize their biological limits. And indeed, one of the themes in the transhumanist movement is a certain denigration of biology or, or, or refusal to accept biological limits of being human. So I want to give you kind of a two minutes of history, since I'm a history professor, I'll historicize the whole story for you. When do we start with transhumanism? The term itself was coined in 1957 uh, by Julian Huxley. Uh, for Julian Huxley, um, this is a, transhumanism is basically a, a short term for what he understood as a new ideology or a new system of ideas appropriate to new men situation. He considered transhumanism a new attitude of mind uh, that would address the crisis of humanity by bridging between the sciences and the arts and by using science to build a, to build a better world. Now probably you know that Julian Huxley was a very close friend of John Burton Sanderson Haldane uh, and of John Desmond Bernal. Those two people, those British um, scientists slash public intellectuals really affected. They are, I call them the prophets of transhumanism. This, their work was done already in the 20s. So in many ways the transhumanist movement today is not doing a lot of new things. Uh, ideologically I think it's all kind of uh, old hat, but what we do have is a new technology that enables the old hat to actually be uh, successful. So what we have here is a kind of a fantasy, which especially in the 1930s in Cambridge was very big among the so-called red scientists of Cambridge, and the belief was that science can solve all human problems uh, because you can actually manufacture or produce a perfect future. And you're going to the tw in the 1940s, especially in England, you have the development of cybernet cybernetics, uh, developed by mathematicians and pioneered by uh, computer scientists. And um, again, now the idea is that cognition itself is possible without a subject, while these people also problematize the notion that the brain is an organ of representation. So something really new happened in the 1940s in the uh, cybernetic movement. 1960s, we have... Um, <coughs> Well, I, I, I should, I should, before I get to the 60s, obviously we have a whole problem in this transhumanist approach because it has to do with eugenics, and the eugenics movement, as you all know, was very big not only in the 1920s and 30s, including in this country, but also is the foundation of um, Nazi Germany's approach. Uh, and it's, uh, what happened in Nazi, under Nazi, uh, the Nazi regime basically uh, made the eugenics uh, really unacceptable. But in the 1960s, um, things begin to change, and especially among uh, science uh, fiction writers, we have new experiments or new thinking, new speculations about the transhuman uh, future. And things are getting to be much more serious in the 1980s when transhumanist ideas such as radical life extension, I'll get to that in a minute, Koreanic space colonization and other futuristic scenarios are all now taken much more seriously by some people that are very well known to you, uh, Ray Kurzweil, Eric Drexler, Frank Tickler, Hans Moravec, people like that. So transhumanism is beginning to really get some traction uh, in the 1980s. And um, the real issue to me, which you kind of alluded to, is the fact that it's becoming also scientifically respectable uh, because it receives a lot of money from uh, the National Science Foundation and from uh, the military complex. So that's an issue that's for us to think about why these pro uh, scenarios are taken so seriously and, and, and why they are getting so much attention from the military. And for me, from the point of view of humanists, a humanist like myself, I see it as a real, as a real problem. Let me take uh, four areas which I find are um, quite difficult uh, in the transhumanist approach to the meaning of being human. First of all, the notion of uh, the, uh, all transhumanists believe that you can change human nature. That's the point of departure that goes all the way back to Julian Huxley. Uh, and they believe that you can do it by designing the human, right? You can design the evolutionary process itself. Uh, this, I believe, is a problem because the evolutionary process works very slowly, whereas the designer evolution, which is what they propose, is a very fast 
process in which you don't really get, you don't really know what you're going to get. So the issue of the unintended consequences is a real problem in a transhumanist approach. So I consider again the design of revolution is uh, an example of human usage. If you take the issue of uh, one of the major themes in the transhumanist uh, project, seems to me is the, um, the not just the pursuit of happiness, but the belief that uh, you can actually be happy uh, here and now. There is a kind of a that undermines.